Hi, everyone. Welcome to the MPRE Professional Responsibility Exam Tips and Tricks. We wanted to make sure that, you know, right now, uh, <laughs> I feel like our MPRE students have been overshadowed by the mess that is the bar exam. And we have the bar exam, you know, as you know, some last week, some next week. And we just want to make sure that, that, that you know that we have not forgotten you. And you, in fact, have a very important exam, which is sort of an element, if you think about it, of the bar exam coming up at the end of this month. So we wanted to put together this sort of tips and tricks for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, a lot of you were like, well, I took professional responsibility and I did well, you know, so I don't have to worry about the MPRE. It is it's really good that you take professional responsibility, of course, before you take the MPRE exam, but the similarities are not as uh, strong as you would think that they are. Um, because the way that the National Conference of Bar Examiners test um, ethics, right, is going to be very different in the way that you learned it and perhaps were tested on it in your professional responsibility class. Unless your professional responsibility class actually utilized MPRE questions, then it, they're usually pretty different. But some professors are doing that nowadays and using uh, MPRE questions. So today we're going to go over for you um, sort of the background of the MPRE, um, the scope of the exam, your testing tips and tricks, your key rules, your key rules, because this can be really important. And we're going to have a question and answer period. And I think one of the things that is going to be really important that Brittany is going to speak with you about, and I, of course, will probably inter interject and interrupt her because that's what I'm best at doing, um, is, you know, some of those key phrasings as well that come up in the MPRE that we want to pay attention to and that we can make sure that we maximize points in that area. So, Brittany, I will turn it over to you with my yes. interruptions. That's okay. Um... Hi, everyone. And so I think that Tanya already gave a little bit of the background, but I will quickly, I know that everyone is coming from different places. So some people maybe are first years wondering about the MPRE. Some people are taking it for the first time. Some people are taking it again and have taken it before. So I'm going to start with a bit of a background and the scope of the exam. And then we'll get into testing tips and tricks, talk about the key rules that are most heavily tested on the exam, and then have a Q&A period. And so as you probably know by now, or many of you probably know, it's a 60 question, 125-minute uh, exam. It's administered by the National Conference of Bar Examiners, or the NCBE. Um, so they're the people who like write the bar exam, and they are the people who also make the questions for the MPRE. And so it's testing predominantly why it helps to take professional responsibility prior to taking the MPRE is because you learn all of the model rules of professional conduct in a professional responsibility class. And then um, that's exactly what's tested on the MPRE. But it also tests the code of judicial conduct, which a lot of PR classes in law school do not get to. Um, and so the, the answer is not to go by the um, code of judicial context and read it, but instead it is to um, just use an outline book or something in order to review the code of judicial conduct. And then you could be tested on some similar rules of evidence. So uh, the attorney client privilege comes up on the MPRE, uh, and then you also might be tested on some generally accepted principles from case law. Um, that might come up in the area of professional responsibility. And what your passing score is, is going to depend upon what jurisdiction you'd like to sit for the bar in. And each exam is typically offered in August, November, and March, but there's an exam in October. So who knows if that's going to be the new trend? <laughs> like that was just kind of put out there by the NCBE. So we don't know if it'll be in October next Next year, too, it typically, though, always is August, November, and March. But now, of course, there's nothing typical about 2020, so we, right. can't, we can't rely on the typical. 
Yeah, so now it's in October. At the end of October, but in October, none belchless. And so the purpose of the MPRE is essentially to, not necessarily to see whether you personally are ethical or not. That's not what the test is. Uh -huh. Instead, uh, maybe it should be, but uh -huh. it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> but instead, it's just to see whether you have knowledge and enough general knowledge of the uh, standard professional responsibility rules that you're likely going to be responsible when you are for when you're in practice. And it tests the wide range of capacity that you may be in or that you may experience. So your capacity as an advocate, your, your capacity as perhaps acting as a chairman on a board or your capacity as a counselor or as a judge or an arbitrator. So the, the scope of the exam tests a lot of different capacities that attorneys could eventually serve in. And then it kind of takes you from like the beginning to the end. And so when you're studying for the MPRE, it actually is quite linear. So you have like applying to the bar and seeing if you're fit in the character and fitness portion of the bar exam and the requirements to apply. Um, and then it takes you through whether uh, and when you may be subject or an attorney may be subject to a disciplinary proceeding in front of the state's board of bar examiners in the question. And so, like I said, your score depends and what score you need depends upon which state you're looking to sit in. And so everyone who's either here or watching this is from all over. So typically when I talk to my students about this, I'm in the East Coast. So I focused on East Coast states, but you wanna make sure that you know what score you need for the jurisdiction that you wanna sit in. Or if you don't know where you wanna sit for the bar yet, maybe where you would like to be licensed, somewhere where you think you would like to be. I always say to aim for an 86 or higher or an 85 or higher. So California is the highest yes. MPRE uh, with an 86. 86. They just right. have to be one point higher than every other state. But by the way, I'm here on the West Coast, so I can, you know, talk about California in this in this capacity. But it's interesting for the longest time, they're like, okay, every you know, the highest score out there is an 85. We're going to be an 86, and you know that's for no other reason than just to keep sort of that, you know, personality of being the hardest in the country for anything with respect to lawyers. Yeah, so if you're not interested in being licensed in California, then shooting for an 80 <gasps> will get you licensed anywhere else, but maybe everyone's interested in being Everyone. <laughs> um, so I always say shoot for an 86 or higher, then you can go in anywhere. You need to, um, but make sure you look at your jurisdiction because in some jurisdictions, you don't need a passing score to skip sit for the bar exam. You just need a passing score to be admitted. But in other jurisdictions, you need a, you need a particular score to even take and sit for a bar exam. So it's really important that you check the jurisdiction's requirements. So one of the things to always think about is that your score is predicated on how many questions you get correct, not how many questions you get wrong. You're not penalized for wrong answers. You just don't get a point for that particular answer. So you want to answer every question, even if you're not exactly sure what the answer is. So every question should be answered because like I said, you're not penalized for wrong answers. You just keep tacking on your points for correct answers. And I just wanted to mention really quick in terms of the scope of this workshop, whether you are a repeat taker or a first time taker, I always think that the scope of the exam and talking about the exam and its breakdown is going to be important. It doesn't matter, I think, if you're taking it for the first time or if you're taking it for the fifth time, okay? I always think a reminder about the scope of the exam is, is important every time that you're thinking about sitting for it because it will ground you. And as you can see right here, we have it broken down by percentages. So it's really, you can really never hear, I feel like too much about exactly how the MPRE is broken down and exactly what is tested how many percentage points. Because that's sort of your grounding point where you can use to start off your, your study process. Yeah, and so, what you want, want to always know is how often or how frequent you're going to see certain rules or areas tested on this exam. And so we can already see just based on the slide that the lawyer client relationship and conflicts of interest 
and litigation and other forms of advocacy are going to be tested likely more than any other topic. But then there are some other topics that are quite heavily tested. So um, client confidentiality is up there. Competence and legal malpractice and civil liability is up there. But you're not likely not going to see as many questions on those topics as client confident, I mean, as conflict of interest or the, liar, the lawyer client relationship. So one of the reasons why it helps to also know this scope and how many questions you might see on each is because walking into this exam, you want to be pretty sharp on conflicts of interest, or you want to be pretty sharp on the lawyer client relationship or the client lawyer relationship, because you know you're going to see a lot of questions in that area. Whereas say for example, you're not too sure or not that great on safekeeping funds, you likely will see maybe one or two questions on it, but that's probably it. So you want to make sure though that you're well versed in these high percentage areas and you know the lower percentage areas, but make sure you're really dedicating time, focus and attention to these higher tested areas. And so if you've taken the exam before, it's really helpful. Well, it's probably helpful in any respect, but especially if you've taken the exam before, it's really good to just do a diagnostic right in the beginning. So to take a 60 question exam cold, not having studied, and then see what your percentages are. And then look at the scope. And if your percentage on that diagnostic was low in conflicts of interest, you want to start there, right? So you want to be able to tackle these areas where you have a high likelihood of seeing it, especially in conjunction with how you're performing on it. And taking a diagnostic can be very helpful in order to do that. Yeah, one of the things that I, I, I love to do with, with our students here at Law Tutors is when, when we do our MPRE program, I like to break up, it's important to do mixed practice exams without a doubt, but I like to break up like how we do the questions, right? So if you can focus on, if you know, as opposed to just doing mixed questions, if you have, you know, our materials or books or anything like that, we really like to focus on, okay, we're going to do questions on this area. We're going to do questions on this area. So as Brittany was mentioning, you can focus, you could, you kind of know right away. You're like, all right, I'm great at, at client confidentiality, but ooh, conflict of interest, don't know so much about that. Um, and so that way you can focus your study early on, um, on these particular areas. While of course though, constantly making sure you go back to those same areas and doing practice exams that are mixed, it is really a good idea to sort of break out the questions in these areas. Yeah, definitely. So, as you probably, some of you know, some of, you may, some of you may not. So you'll get a fact pattern, which is a factual scenario, typically dealing with an ethical dilemma. And then for, um, and then you will have um, a particular question about that fact pattern, which I refer to as the call of the question. And then there will be four answer options or four answer alternatives. One is correct and one is incorrect, uh, or three are incorrect, sorry. And then, you likely have about two minutes per question to answer them. So a little bit of time, some might take you faster than others. So you might take one minute to answer a short one, but then you might need three minutes on a longer fact pattern. So on the MPRE lately, we should expect to see some longer fact patterns. That's kind of becoming a trend uh, recently on the MPRE where the fact patterns can be like three paragraphs or two large paragraphs rather than some short, concise little multiple choice question. So just to keep that in mind for your stamina and when you're practicing. Yeah, and it's funny because on the bar exam, they're making questions. They went from long fact patterns to shorter fact patterns. But I think to make up for that, on the MPRE, they've gone to longer fact patterns. That's my theory. Yeah, it's a good theory. I mean, <laughs> for sure. The NCBE, you never yeah. know. Yeah, seriously. So one of the things too that I think is good news about the MPRE as opposed to something like the bar exam is that it's very limited in scope. You're only tested on one subject. So you're very limited in the range of issues that you might see. So the more multiple choice practice you do before sitting for the exam, the better you will be because you will start to see patterns in the questions. There's only so many ways the examiners can test conflicts of interest. There's only so many ways that the examiners can test client confidentiality. So the more questions you expose yourself to, the better you will be walking into this exam because you'll say, okay, well, 
I've done like 150 conflicts of interest questions. So whatever they're going to throw at me is not going to be that new. It's going to be pretty much something very similar to what I've seen before. So the more practice you do, the more you'll be able to recognize similar fact patterns. I think it's a good idea to try to hit almost 1000 questions walking into the exam if you can. That way you're giving yourself a really good range of practice walking in. So one of the things, now we're kind of going to jump into the tips and tricks portion, which is my favorite. And so I'll, talk, I'll tell you a little bit about why I made these tips and tricks. So I am like a nerd and I used to take the MPRE a lot. So I used to take it like every other exam administration to see trends and to see how it was going and everything like that. And so I've noticed important themes and questions and by doing so many of these questions and so many of these exams, I've come up with similar themes to always watch out for. So a lot of these tips and tricks are going to do with pull, or, or have to do with pulling out these themes and really looking closely at certain themes that you're going to see when you are in the realm of the MPRE. So the first big theme is to pay attention to statements in the fact pattern about the lawyer or the client's state of mind. So anytime the fact pattern tells you to know something or, or that the lawyer knows or believes something to be true, Typically, that's going to be the precise ethical issue the question is testing because many of these rules focus on the lawyers, whether they know something and then act or believe something and then act or why they don't know something so they won't be subject to discipline. So you want to pay attention to words such as knows, knowingly, becomes convinced, believes, reasonably believes. That is all really important. And a good example, there are many rules, but a really good example of this is when a lawyer is recommending a future attorney's admittance to the bar. And so if I'm recommending someone to the bar and I know they have a felony from when they were 21 and I say I don't know and I recommend them to the bar anyway and don't disclose it, I will be subject to discipline because I knew something and I didn't disclose it. However, same scenario, I'm recommending someone to the bar and I don't know about that felony from when they were 21. The candidate never told me about it. It's never come up. I'm not going to be subject to discipline for not disclosing that and recommending them to the bar. So knowingly and though that language becomes really, really important on the exam. So when you see that in a fact pattern, knows, believes, or anything similar, you wanna underline it and you can bet that that's the issue that's going to be tested. It's going to be testing a rule that's triggering an attorney needing to know or believe something in order to be subject to discipline. So another issue, not only is what they know or believe important, but also their motivation for doing something or their reasoning for acting or failing to, failing to act. And so anytime that the examiners give you a reason the, the lawyer does something or the reason that they don't do something, that's going to be really important. Typically, that reason is going to be embedded in the rule that it's testing. And then, for example, it will just really help you determine it and narrow down that ethical issue that you're going to be tested on. One of the biggest tips that I can give anyone studying for the MPRE is to not get distracted by distractors in the fact pattern. And there are a lot of them. So a lot of times the, the National Conference of Bar Examiners will give you this really fluffy fact pattern and it will be about a lawyer and what they're doing, but then it also tells you a lot about the client and what they think about their lawyer and everything. And it doesn't really matter what the client thinks about their lawyer. So we want to mm -hmm. focus on the lawyer's core behavior in these questions and only underline the lawyer or whoever the judge the judge's or the lawyer's behavior. So that way you don't get distracted by the window dressings of proper behavior. So a lot of times the examiners couch unethical conduct in allegedly good behavior. So like for example, say the lawyer ends up getting a settlement agreement or a settlement offer from opposing counsel. 
And they say, you know what? I'm not even going to take that offer to my client because my client would absolutely reject it. And we know if we just focus on the lawyer's core behavior that that's ethical. You have to take a settlement offer to your client. But then the fact pattern also tells you that the lawyer does eventually, after rejecting the offer, they tell the client their settlement offer and the client says, thank goodness, I wouldn't have accepted that anyway. I'm so happy you rejected it. So the examiners are couching good behavior or a good outcome with unethical conduct. So it doesn't matter, right? Even if the client said, I wouldn't have accepted that anyway, or I'm so happy you rejected it, the lawyer is still subject to discipline because they, their behavior itself, if we isolate it from the question, is unethical. I feel like this comes up a lot with commingling too. Like lawyers are like, I'm just gonna borrow money from the trust account, but I'll put it back later. Like one of the biggest sources of disqualification and disbarment is finding out that you've commingled funds. But regardless of a benign outcome, Brittany is absolutely correct. We don't, we don't just concentrate on the damage done to the client. Although we, you know, yes, that malpractice action, but it's definitely we concentrate on the lawyer's behavior. Right. So you also don't want to fall similarly, so like a good outcome, you don't want to fall into the trap of something uh, in the red herring of it being dressed in the fact that the client wasn't prejudiced at all. So it's, it's okay. So even if the lawyer engages in unethical conduct and the client was not prejudiced by this conduct, it's the conduct itself we are looking at. So we don't care if it prejudiced the client or not, we only care about the lawyer's core behavior, right? So similar, a really good example of this is that commingling of funds. So a lawyer takes a bunch of money from his client or her client because they need it, and then they replace it later. So the client ended up never being prejudiced, but we don't care because we only want to focus on that the lawyer's core conduct at that time. So anytime you see an answer choice, that says the lawyer will not be subject to discipline because the client wasn't prejudiced or the client was not adversely affected, those answer choices are always wrong because we don't care whether the client was prejudiced or adversely affected or not. We only are focusing on the lawyer's core behavior. What also is a really common red herring on these questions is the client insisting that the lawyer violate a model rule. So a client's insistence on unethical behavior does not negate liability, right? So the lawyer is still going to be subject to discipline if, for example, they um, do something unethical and then they can't use this as a defense. Well, my client made me do it. Really common example of this is frivolous, frivolous claims. So client goes to me and says, hey, lawyer, um, I hate my ex, hate them, hate them, hate them. I want to make their life so miserable. So I want to file all of this discovery on them just for the purpose of annoying them. And I say, you know, you can't do that. We can't file discovery or file actions just at, for the purpose of annoyance. We just can't do that. And the client says, no, no, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to fire you or I'm going to report you. And I say, okay, okay, I'll do it then. I'll just do it, right? Just because my client was insisting I do it, it doesn't make it right. I will still be subject to discipline. So the client's insistence, like I said, doesn't do anything. We're still focusing right on that lawyer's core behavior. And, and just as a caveat to that, and that's absolutely true. I've had a lot of clients who are just like, just do this um, many, many times. Um, just, um, as a caveat to that, if the client wants to sort of annoy the opposition or, or, um, do anything like that, right? Um, it's okay as long as there is a proper purpose, right? Where it's like, I really want to get my ex-husband, but there's also a proper person actually filing a divorce against him. Just make sure you understand that's okay. It can't solely be for an improper person purpose. Right. And so focus like so that these those were tips focusing on the fact patterns and what to look out for. You also always want to pay attention to details. 
details about people, places, and things, right? Typically, the devil is in the details. The answer, the issue, the ethical issue that's being tested is in the details. So you want to pay attention to adjectives, adverbs, any descriptions. That is typically what the question is going to be testing and going to be focusing on. So a lot of those tips were substantive, so tips regarding what you should be looking for in these fact patterns and what you should be really paying attention to and what things in these fact patterns trigger ethical issues. Now, the next set of tips have to deal with how to study for this thing, right? How to best maximize your chance of getting the MPRE score that you want to. And a common thing that I hear a lot from students studying for the MPRE is they say, you know, Professor Raposa, like I'm plateauing, like my score is not going up. I'm getting the same percentages every single time I do questions, nothing's changing and I don't know what I'm doing wrong and I'm doing so many questions. So there's a difference between doing a lot of questions and then studying with the questions, right? So just doing questions and studying with questions are actually two different things. Just because you do a lot of questions doesn't mean you're studying with the questions appropriately. So now I want to focus on tips regarding how to study with these practice questions. And so one thing that I want to just stress is there's a, is there's a tremendous difference between passive and active studying. And a lot of students, when they study for multiple choice question exams, they passively study. So they do a set of 25, they just read the answers and explanations and then just move on. That's a very passive form of studying. You're just taking information in but not doing anything with it and then you're never looking at it again. So you wanna make sure that you're actively studying with these questions. And so what do I mean by that? Every time you do questions and you get them wrong, you should be writing down why you're getting the question wrong or writing down what is the ethical rule that you're missing or what's the nuance that you're missing in this question that forced you to get it wrong. So on this slide, you'll see I have a lot of questions to ask yourself and to write down after you're reviewing a set of questions that you've done. So when you look at a question, ask yourself, why are you wrong? What did you miss in the facts, if anything? What rule are you missing? What rule do you not know? What exception maybe do you not know that this is testing and write that down? And how do you avoid making this mistake again, right? And you avoid making it by charting this out, right? Tracking your progress, writing down why you're wrong, um, and writing down rules you missed, write down facts that were tricky to you. So if you get a fact pattern and you didn't realize that it was testing an exception. Also write down the facts that if from that question that triggered the exception. You'll have a nice sheet or, or uh, an Excel spreadsheet for yourself of everything that you're missing um, and everything not to be tricked on again. So this would be actively studying with the questions and not just passively studying with them. Yeah, one of the things that um, I know that we, we love to do here because Brittany and I and the rest of, of law shooters are so all about, you know, coming up with solutions for these things is we always like to have our students oh we have pre-made excel spreadsheets for you but you can also make your excel spreadsheets for yourself depending on how you learn and sometimes the students say to us but that's going to take so long but act active learning just remember is not about the quantity of the questions that you do you certainly don't want to be like well i just did five questions active learning i'm done right the active learning process is the studying process right it's not just passively reading an outline and then doing 25 questions. Here, you're actively studying while you're doing questions and really tracking it. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna then later on do questions timed, you know, without doing this. But one of the things that we always say in these sort of, these, these tricks about active studying is that um, it's probably a good idea not to do like, 30 or 40 and then go back, right? Because sometimes we don't always remember why we got something wrong. So it's a good idea to probably do like five at a time, like five and then go back and review and do these steps that Brittany talked about. And then five and then go back and review and do these steps that Brittany talked about. It does not mean you cannot do a full practice exam and do this also. But I would say that in the beginning, so you don't forget like, 
I don't remember 40 questions ago why I got this wrong. I would say that in the beginning, it would be a great idea to just do like five at a time so that it's still fresh in your mind and that you remember why you got it wrong, why you missed the facts and how to avoid making that mistake again. Then going back after you do like 60 questions and you're just tired and you're just like, I don't want to do this and I don't remember. Yeah. So it's definitely one thing to do a bunch of practice questions, but it's another to actually learn from them. And so all of the advice that we've just given you is advice to learn from them, to not make these mistakes again, and then to see no longer this, nothing's happening with my score, it's plateauing. Now you'll see a score increase. And that's kind of the goal of, of studying actively with them. And so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry, just about the questions. One more thing. And I, I just want to let you know, and you'll, you'll hear this with the bar exam. I'm just giving you a sort of a preview to this. It also works for the MPRB. I can't tell you how many times you've gotten students that's like, I've done, I did 3,000, 4,000 questions for the bar exam, for example, but I didn't pass. I've heard the same thing about the MPRE. We've done every practice test in every single MPRE book, and I still didn't pass. And I suspect, and not only do I suspect, I know usually nine, 10 out of 10, it's because there wasn't active learning involved in doing those questions. So you're just going to make the same, it doesn't matter how many practice questions you do. I mean, you do need to do enough, but you're just gonna keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. So whether you do, um, you know, 100 or you do 500, they really have to be intentional. Yeah, definitely. And you want to be intentional with everything you do, no matter what you're studying for. But like, in life, too. Yeah. You know, and it's like, in life. yeah, because it's just like, and you don't under, you, I don't think a lot of people realize that they're studying unintentionally or they're not being in an, uh, like, intentional. Yeah. With it, but it's a thing. Um, and you just want to make sure that you're doing it to the best of your ability. Absolutely. Yeah, and so one other thing I suggest doing, which relates to this, is making a list of rules you don't know or don't understand. And, and so that way you have this one-stop place that might be one page long, maybe it'll be seven pages long, but you always have something to review at the end of a week, rules you don't know, so that way you know them, and you start to memorize them a little bit better to get these questions correct. So now, that's kind of how to study for this exam. And now it's how to, uh, the, the final like kind of set of tips and tricks is how to approach these questions <coughs> and how to approach these questions in a way where it can maximize your success on these questions. And so, like I said, you're going to see a fact pattern and it's going to be followed by choices A through D, so four answer choices. And so the first thing that you always wanna do is Always read the call of the question first. So that final question at the end of the fact pattern, because it might tell you already what the ethical issue is. A lot of times it won't. Like a lot of times, a very popular call of the question is, is the attorney subject to discipline? And you have no idea what they're going to be subject to discipline for. So that doesn't help you. But say, for example, the call of the question is, can the attorney represent both the corporation and the firm at the same time? That's going to tell you that you know it's a conflict of interest question. So you can read the fact pattern with the ethical issue already in mind. So first step is always to read the call of the question. And then if the call of the question is kind of vague and doesn't tell you what the ethical issue is that's being tested, then the, the biggest thing to do is read the fact pattern and pull out that ethical issue specifically, not just is there a conflict of interest? But instead, is there a concurrent conflict, right? Or is there a prospective client conflict, right? You wanna be very precise when you're picking out the ethical issue that's being tested. Not just, for example, did the lawyer violate their duty of client confidentiality? The more specific ethical issue to pull out would be, did the lawyer or was the lawyer permitted to disclose confidential client information to defend themselves in litigation, right? You want to make sure that you're pulling out the very specific, specific ethical issue being tested. So there is a question formula. I'm all about, let's check yes. it. So there is a question formula. 
So read the call of the question first, read that fact pattern, pick out the ethical issue from that fact pattern. And you don't state it out loud, right? Because you don't want to get kicked out of the exam, but tell yourself what is the particular rule that relates to that ethical issue. Then, you know, make sure you think about any definitions that are applicable to that rule. And then always ask yourself, okay, are there any exceptions that apply to this scenario? Because you can bet that one answer choice will be just be applying the general rule and one will be applying an exception. So you always wanna ask, are there any applicable exceptions here? And then of course, analyze it and then pick the answer choice that best matches your analysis. But this, these steps are very critical because you want to pull out the issue, you want to be able to ask yourself the rule, but then you also want to make sure you're not forgetting about any exceptions so that way you're not missing the answer choice that chooses the exception. So like, and I kind of already hinted at this, I always get ahead of myself. It's because I get excited when I talk about stuff. Um, anyway, so um, there are two different types of calls of the question, a general call and a specific call. So a general call is, is the lawyer subject to discipline? You yourself have to pick out the specific issue from the fact pattern itself. But then you might get a specific call, which looks like, is it proper for the attorney to represent both parties in the contempt proceeding? That tells you, a specific call of the question tells you what the issue is. So for example, I know from that specific call of the question that conflicts of interest is being tested. Yep. So now I wanna review just some questions or topics that are you can bet, I would probably bet Tanya like $500 that these topics are going to be tested the most on the exam. And so it's important to go over them, but I'm also going to go over them in a way how you should study for them. So how should you study rules on the MPRE? You shouldn't just say, I'm going to study model rule 11.2 today. It should instead be, what's the general rule and then what are the exceptions? That's how you should study for every subset of a rule. What's the rule and then what are the applicable exceptions and how do those exceptions come up? That's how you always want to study this material. Rule exception, rule exception. Um, and don't study it any other way. And so, when you're studying for this exam, I always recommend, you, I mean, you can of course use and, and read the rule book if you want to, but it's really helpful to use an outline. So from a commercial course, Law Tutors has outlines for the MPRE. You wanna be able to use an outline so that way the material is being presented to you in a way that you're responsible for and that's concise. But then you also wanna say for everything, okay, for conflicts, for prospective client conflicts, I need to know the rule and then I need to know the exceptions. Or for violating con uh, confidentiality rules, I need to know the rules for confidentiality and then I need to know the exceptions. And you should be thinking about it always in that way, that step-by-step -step process. And so now we're gonna go over some of these really, really heavily tested areas in a, in a way that also sheds light on how you should be studying for these areas. So. What I'm going to look at first is the creating a lawyer-client relationship, talking a little bit about attorney's fees and the scope of representation, communication with between lawyer and client, and then termination of the lawyer-client relationship. Then I'm going to move into conflicts of interest and talk a little bit about those rules and how to study with those types of issues, since these two areas are the most heavily tested on the MPRE. So how Remember, we're starting generally, and then our scope when we're studying is going to get more narrow down to the exception. So how is a client and a lawyer-client relationship created? A person has to indicate an intent that the lawyer will provide legal services to them, or the lawyer cannot clearly state that the lawyer doesn't represent this person, right? Um, or in the alternative, a tribunal or a court can appoint a lawyer to represent a client, which is a court appointed creation of a relationship. So there are some tricks here. Um, and there are some tricks that we see from trends that are being tested in these questions. So 
One of the tricks has to do with implied consent or assent rather and reasonable reliance. So when is a lawyer's assent to representing a client implied? And this is kind of a hidden issue that's tested because a lot of students go into these questions and think, well, the lawyer never said they would represent the client or they're the lawyer never signed anything with the client to, to agree to any type of representation. But if a lawyer fails to clearly decline representation and a reasonable per and the client reasonably relies on that lawyer's services, then a representation could absolutely be created. So you're looking on reliance and you're looking at, again, if we remember from the tip last time, what does the lawyer do? What do they believe? And why do they do something or not do something? So their failure to do something in this type of relationship might mean that now they are stuck in this lawyer-client relationship. Another trick in how this is tested deals with court appointments. And so a lawyer can't avoid a court appointment um, except for good cause. And so I put some examples here that are frequently tested and they all come up in the questions released by the National Conference of Bar Examiners. So if a lawyer representing the, their court appointed client would result in them violating some type of rule, like an ethical rule, if it would create an unreasonable financial burden, or the lawyer finds them so morally repugnant that their representation is going to be impacted, those are the three main reasons why a lawyer and, and and three main reasons that have been tested as to why a lawyer can avoid or not take a court appointment. So Brittany, I just wanted to, um, I get this question all the time. So if a client, if you give advice to an inquiry about their situation, do you think in that situation, you know, they've called a couple of times, they haven't officially retained you, would you say that in that situation, it would be still clear to say, listen, I'm, I'm giving you advice, but we don't have a, a client lawyer relationship? Well, I think that in, if this was tested on the MPRE, there would have to be a definitive statement from the, the lawyer by, to the client that says, I'm giving you legal advice, but this legal advice is not representation. Right. This and is, I am in no way representing you, nor am I going to, but here's my advice. So in the MPRE question, that will have to be quite clear. Quite clear. And, and I just want to tell, you know, our students out there to distinguish one very important thing. Not representing someone does not mean, I don't want to use too many negatives here, so let me take that again. Just because you've declined to represent somebody, the conversation between you and that potential client is still considered confidential. And I always tell this to my, my inquiries too. I say, listen, you can talk to me during this inquiry process. I'm not your attorney and I'm not giving this as your attorney, but this will stay, still remain confidential. So don't confuse representation with the duty of confidentiality. Because the duty of confidentiality sort of attaches as soon as you're talking to this potential client, um, even though the attorney-client relationship may not. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. Um, and that's kind of where in the MPRE certain issues overlap. So confidentiality could overlap with a conflicts of interest question in terms of a prospective client, but you can't divulge prospective client information to others either. Um, and so we, you could see that merge on the MPRE with topics being tested. So a lawyer also has a duty to reject certain cases. This comes up quite frequently on the MPRE as well. So if a client wants to file a lawsuit that the lawyer knows is frivolous, has absolutely no basis in law and fact, but the client wants to embarrass someone by serving it, you know, then the lawyer has a duty to reject that type of case. Or, and similarly and related, if the case presents a financially or legally frivolous position. However, this is a very big MPRE trick in terms of that something being frivolous versus something being not frivolous. It's a very fine line, but the fact pattern in the question will tell you that the lawyer has a good faith argument. Once you see that trigger, those trigger words in the question, good faith argument, it's not frivolous. So you don't wanna pick the answer choice that says it's frivolous. 
There's also a difference between a lawyer thinking that something is a, lo a losing case and a frivolous case, right? So like say, I just had a case recently where my client wanted to stop all child support payments. And I knew that was a losing case, but there was a good faith argument for it because it's really hard to stop child support payments. Like almost impossible depending upon very, very extreme circumstances. But there was a good faith argument to stop it. So me filing that lawsuit would not have been frivolous. Even though I knew it was going to lose, sorry, um, it wasn't frivolous, right? So the facts, again, will be very intentional. If the examiners want you to know something is frivolous, it will be obvious. But if the examiners say that the lawyer just knows it's a losing case, but that there's a good faith argument, it's not frivolous. And then so there's a, another three other circumstances that I think kind of we can group them together as to why a lawyer has to reject cases. The lawyer is incompetent and note that incompetence doesn't just mean like what it sounds like. Like if someone came to me with a securities regulation case, like I'm definitely going to be incompetent to handle that matter. Never practice securities regulations. Don't know a thing about it. I'm not going to be able to handle it. So I'm incompetent. But I also can be incompetent if, and I, I kind of call it incompetence, if I got like 150 cases right now and I don't have time for this person, but I'm going to take their case anyway, I have a duty to reject that case if I don't have time for them, if I'm too busy. So that's just another instance in which that can happen. And then if the lawyer's mental or physical condition is going to materially impair the representation or if they have strong personal feelings against the, the client in which would it, in, impair their ability. Huge tip here, right? We see a pattern. If the lawyer is going to be impaired in any way, the details in the question, right? Focus on those details. If the details in the question have to do with the fact that the lawyer may be impaired or not be able to represent this client fully, then the lawyer likely has a duty to reject those cases. So attorney's fees are very heavily tested on the MPRE. They have to be reasonable. Reasonable is like the golden standard for everything, I feel like, in every subject, but particularly dealing with attorney's fees. I put here on this slide some things that go factor into determining whether an attorney's fee is reasonable. And I put those in here because a lot of times we see these reasons in the answer choice. Um, so like, for example, the, the question could be, is the attorney's, is the attorney's uh, fee, you know, impermissible or will the attorney be subject to discipline due to their fee? And the answer might be no, because considering the time and labor required and the amount the fee is charged in the, in, in the regular area, the attorney's not subject to discipline. So you might see these factors or these reasons in an answer choice. So in order to determine whether a fee is reasonable, we'll look at the time and labor that's required, the difficulty of the case, how much time is this case going to take? Can I not represent anybody else during this time? Um, how much skill is required? Uh, can I handle it or can a younger associate handle it? Like what's going on? Um, can I not do any other work if I represent this person? Is this a similar fee in the community? And is this a similar fee that I charge other clients in the community? Um, what is my reputation, my experience, and my ability? Um, and so those are just some um, factors come, that come into play when determining whether a fee is reasonable. And then one big kind of takeaway here, especially not only in the area of fees, but a, a, another common theme so you'll notice that a lot of this webinar, we're talking about themes, not only in what types of facts you'll see, not only in test taking strategies, but also in particular substantive areas of law. So there's a big theme of taking advantage. Every time you see a lawyer taking advantage or feeling like the lawyer is taking advantage of a client in a fact pattern, it's likely because the lawyer or the lawyer is doing something unethical and the lawyer is going to be subject to discipline. So the lawyer can never take advantage of a client. The fees have to be collected um, in a reasonable manner. You can't harass your client to pay you 
many times we would love to, but we can't. Yeah. Right. No. Um, and so you can never be seen as coercing or taking advantage of your clients. Yes. Big theme. There's um a, a couple things just to mention. Um, you know, if if and this comes up with litigation, you know, if you you know some some attorneys will try to withdraw and stuff like that if they aren't paid, but there's even limitations on that. You you can certainly threaten to withdraw from a client, but there's even limitations on that. Um, I've been a practicing attorney for 20 years, and I have certainly been in many 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 situations where a client hasn't paid or will not pay, and Brittany's 100% correct. We particularly have to be very, very careful about how we ask the client to pay. And one other thing I just want to mention about collecting fees in advance, but having to return the unearned, unearned portion, that is 100% true for fees and unearned fees like hourly fees. There are different rules that apply to flat fees. Um, with respect to if you are charging a flat fee. And the only reason I bring this up is because the trend right now, you know, among the lawyers is a little bit more, not for litigation, but for example, I'm a corporate lawyer, towards doing certain flat fee packages. And that rule does not apply because the flat fee is normally considered earned when you receive it. So there is no actual re, you know, refund, of course, if you end up not doing any work or there's a, a dispute. But that is different than an hourly fee. Right. And so we also have contingency fees. And a lot of the questions test whether the contingency itself was proper. And so a contingency fee just means that you're not going to get any money up front before representation, but you're going to receive a portion of the earnings or a portion of the award or whatnot. And so, and you typically get it only if it's favorable, if you win. And so Nothing changes though, the contingency fee still has to be reasonable. And in order to have a proper contingency fee, it has to be in writing and signed by the client. And note the difference between a contingency fee and a regular fee. A fee agreement doesn't necessarily have to be in writing, right? But it should be, but it doesn't have to be, but a contingency fee agreement does, has to be in writing signed by the client. So then we have the issue of fee disputes. Very, very popular type of question on the MPRE in a really nuanced area. So what could come up when fee disputes? So we already talked about this. You can't use illegal collection methods. Uh, you can't use confidential information in order to get some money, right? You can't say, hey, listen, I'm gonna tell everyone what you did last summer if you don't pay me, right? Like you, you know can't you do that. <laughs> if you There's a movie that. about that. I know what you did last summer. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my, it's one of my favorites. And tis the season, it is October. Horror movie. Um, and so it's on my mind because I said to myself, I think I'm going to watch I Know What You Did Last Summer and some horror movies, like some classics soon because it's October. Anyway, <laughs> that's probably why I just came up with that example because I'm a you know. <laughs> Um, and then, um, if the lawyer, you know, if there's a dispute as to the fee, remember the disputed amount has to stay in the client trust account. The lawyer can't say, oh, I'll keep it, you know, and then if I end up, I'll, maybe I'll just give it back to the client later. The disputed amount has to stay in the client's trust account and the lawyer can only take the earned undisputed portion of the fee. Anything not earned has to go back to the client. So a very popular type of question too, dealing with fees, fee splitting with other attorneys. Like, I feel like a lot of students think that this is fine. Yeah. Fee split because I, to be honest, I think it might happen on like regularly in practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and I, you know, I've been a lawyer for 20 years. I know I've said that many times, but I want to compare myself as an old lawyer to a new lawyer. Um, this comes up constantly and even it with my colleagues who are like yeah you know i'll give you a referral for your week and i'm like whoa you know have we forgot about these rules and it is still important it's especially important for new attorneys too because as you're getting your feet wet 
you may start doing work with other attorneys and things like that. So I would have to say that this is an extraordinarily important part because it is not as straightforward as you might think it is. Yeah, and so you can't generally split fees with another lawyer. So that this is how I'm kind of talking about how to study for the MPRE. General rule and then the exceptions, right? Yep. So you should know generally when you see a question about fee splitting, you cannot do it. However, then that next step, remember, if you remember from our checklist is, ask yourself, are there any exceptions? And so there are. And so a lawyer can split her fee with another lawyer who isn't in their firm if the total fee is reasonable, the split is either in proportion to the work performed or for the responsibility taken over the case, and the client agrees to the split in writing. These are ands, not ors, right? Right. So you have to have all of them. Exactly. Just that second one is an or, meaning you either split in oh, right. services performed or you take res the respective responsibility. But the fee has to be reasonable. You either have to have one or the two proportion to the services rendered or the responsibility, and then the client agrees to the split in writing. So big tip, right? Just referring someone a case and then getting some money for it, it's not good. So nope. if I refer Tanya this contract case and she's like, thanks, Britt, take, here's 200 bucks. You can't do that, right? You can't do that. Really, you're gonna air all my dirty laundry? No. That, that only happened once, okay? <laughs> Just no. kidding. Just kidding. And so we also, what also is heavily tested is the scope of representation. So it's really important to study this method in terms of what decisions have to be made by a client and then all others don't, right? So the decisions made by a client are settlement offers, pleas in criminal cases, waiving a jury trial in a criminal case. Note that is not waiving a jury trial in a civil case. So if a lawyer does that, they're not subject to discipline. Uh, waiving, or sorry, testifying, the decision to testify at a criminal case, and then the decision whether to appeal. So all of those decisions need to be made by a client. All other decisions, typically the lawyer has discretion to make. So a big study tip for this is to memorize these, and then if a lawyer does something else, at a strategy, right, and doesn't consult with the decision that's made by the client, it's likely going to be okay. But what about those situations, and I get this, client, uh, this question a lot as well, is where a client says ahead of time, and this has happened to me so many times, I'm just going to leave the settlement offer up to you. Like, any, anything that they, they tell you is fine by me if you want to accept or reject. Right, so typically that's okay, but that just needs to be explicit. Or something that happens in these questions is the client says, please reject anything under $100,000. Yes. Right, and then if the lawyer gets an offer for $80,000 and doesn't consult with the client, that's okay because they got prior consent from the client. Right. So again, the examiners will be very intentional with their language. They'll tell you if a client did that or not for a reason. Right. So then what, this is also, so this has been coming up a lot on the MPRE being tested, limiting the scope of representation. And that's because I think it's, there's a trend towards doing limited representation. Now. Absolutely. So like, for example, a lot of times when I'm hired, sometimes I'll just get hired for a pretrial. Like mm -hmm. I'm representing the client in the pretrial conference and nothing more at that point. Um, and you can do that. So as long as there's informed consent and the representation is reasonable under the circumstances, the lawyer can limit the scope of their representation with a client. Absolutely. I'm just, I do that all the time in my practice because I won't do corporate litigation anymore. I've retired from that. Um, but I will do corporate representation up until the time that say a complaint is filed. And I think that the informed consent part really has to do, you know, what you're explicitly putting in your agreement or some other form of informed consent has to be explicit. Yeah. And so another thing, and this kind of falls under lawyer's limits to me, is that dealing with a client with diminished capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very popularly tested area. So one reason, because if the, if 
you can't just assume from the question that the lawyer can divulge client information or do anything else just because the client has diminished capacity. So because the lawyer in the general sense, right, general rule, the lawyer has to re maintain a relationship as normal as possible with their client. If the client, it's not until these facts would be triggered, if the client faces a risk of substantial physical or financial harm, then the lawyer may be able to take actions to protect the client from that financial or physical harm, including perhaps seeking a guardian ad litem or revealing client information in order to help the client. But without those triggering facts, without the triggering facts of the client being at risk of substantial or financial harm, it's not okay for the lawyer to circumvent the client and do those things because remember the general rule, they have to maintain a normal relationship with that client. So you might also be tested on issues regarding communications with clients. So what is the, what is the attorney responsible for doing with their client? They have to promptly inform their client of any decision that requires their consent. You have to keep them reasonably informed about their case and the status of their case. Um, respond promptly when the client makes reasonable requests for information. And so, like I said, the NCBE will be very intentional. There's a different, they won't test you like, is 10 days? Like, what's 10 days? Like, they're not going to yeah. test you on that. But instead, they might test you on like one day as opposed to like three months. Like three months is probably not reasonable mm -hmm. without talking to your client versus like a couple of days is going to be fine. And then this is really big. So consulting with your client anytime you think that your client um, is either going to do something unethical or is going to want you to do something unethical. And that's important because there's a lot of questions in which say, Tanya is my client. She comes to me and says, I'm going to commit a fraud. I'm going to do it. Or I'm going to- she's just airing all my dirty laundry. And yeah. using everything I do as an example. Yeah. Or she comes to me and says, Brittany, I know we have trial tomorrow, but I'm going to lie on the witness stand. I'm going to do it. And, I, and then there's two different types of questions, right? Sometimes the MPRE questions will say, me as a lawyer, I'm going to go, I'm going to go tell someone right away. I'm going to contact the judge and write them a letter saying my client's going to lie on the stand. That would actually subject me to discipline because I have a duty to talk to my client first to say, Tanya, lying on the stand is called perjury. Perjury is a crime. It's actually a felony in a lot of jurisdictions. And also it will de be detrimental to you because it will also impact our case at hand. Not only will you be charged with perjury, but you will also probably lose this case for us. And if you do end up lying on the stand, I will have to know or disclose that I know that was a lie after you've done it. And I'll have to do that. I have to do that first. And I have to communicate with my client first before I go do something egregious, right? So Always look for that communication between the attorney and the client first before the attorney then circumvents their client. Very similar to the, the instance we just talked about with diminished capacity, it's another trend. So communication first and then straying away from the attorney-client relationship second. Oops, so sorry. I'm like getting ahead of myself. I told you I get excited. And so when then, so we kind of went through the whole process. We got hired we got paid, then we got, had some issues with communication, and then the relationship is terminated. So how can this relationship be terminated? You can get fired. I've gotten fired twice in my career so far. Um, pretty good, uh, but I'm so angry about the reasons, but that's a story for a different day. <laughs> um, uh, or, there's two situations in which, in which I can withdraw from a case and then I have to. So mandatory versus permissive. Another big MPRE taking tip, right? Withdrawal is one of those areas where something's either mandatory or permissive, but there are other areas of the MPRE as well. So make sure when you have this, you chart out what's mandatory and what's permissive because you'll have an answer choice that says the attorney shall do something or the attorney may do it. So you want to make sure you're picking the correct answer in terms of must 
or may or shall or may. And so there's a very only a limited amount of circumstances in which withdrawal is mandatory. So that's when the attorney's physical or mental health um, or condition is going to inhibit their ability to represent the client or continued representation would require the attorney to uh, violate a law. So if you have those two circumstances, you're going to want to pick the answer choice that's mandatory, that says shall or must. But in any other situation, which is on the right hand here, you're never going to want to pick the definitive shall or must answer choice because it's only permissive. An attorney does not have to withdraw in any of these circumstances, but they may do so, right? So if they, if the client persists in criminal or fraudulent conduct, if they use the attorney services to commit a past crime, not present because that would be mandatory, but a past crime or fraud. Um, if I find my client so repugnant and awful, I can't represent them. If the client breaks their promise to you. And so what does that mean? I had a case back in the day um, where a client, if we were in a child custody case or a child custody hearing and my client said, I'm sober. I haven't drank in two years. And then I, I, can, I don't have to get custody taken away from me. I don't know what my ex is talking about. I'm sober and I have been for over two years. And then got a breathalyzer, blue point, something really high, admitted to drinking again. So the lies were so heavy that I could not represent this person because I was starting to misrepresent based on their misrepresentations. Um, I have had this situation um, yeah. with, had, which has had all of these, by the way, um, uh, insisting on fraudulent conduct, all of this sort of stuff. Um, and what's interesting is you have to understand the difference between you're representing them that would require you to violate the law or disciplinary rule versus the client themselves persisting in criminal or fraudulent conduct. And so uh, just an example I'll, I'll, I'll let you know of is that I submitted evidence to the court by way of exhibits and I later found out that the exhibits were a lie and they were either forged affidavits. And so that was a very fine line um, because the client wanted to persist in keeping those exhibits in. But if you can imagine, <clears throat> I submitted those and my continuing to represent that they were in any way true or questioning clients or excuse me, witnesses about them would have been required me to do a mandatory withdrawal. So in that case, I gave the client two choices. I said, I'm either telling the court or I'm withdrawing. And he did let me tell the court, which of course tanked the case for us because nobody could believe him. Um, however, I have had situations with the same client where it was, um, you know, he was repugnant. He wanted me to break rules. He unreasonable financial burden, all of those things. And I was not able to withdraw because they were number one, permissive, and number two, we were in the midst of litigation. So you may withdraw in those situations, but do not believe that you will always be allowed to withdraw if a judge, and always a judge, can circumvent that rule. Right, and so because they're permissive, so it's someone else kind of making the decision for you. I wanted to get out of one of my cases um, because I started being a professor and I didn't want to represent, I didn't, this case was kind of uh, in depth. It took a lot of time. And so I wanted to withdraw based on that. And I got denied because I was in the case already for three years. So it's, it really, knowing the difference between permissive and mandatory is really important. And then you might be tested on what happens after the withdrawal. So you have to give your client reasonable notice and a chance to get another attorney. Um, you also have to refund them any fee that's not earned and you have to give them their file. And so one of the a really popular question is the attorney says, hey, you owe me a grand. So once you pay me that grand, I will give you your file. You can't do that, right? You can't withhold stuff that's the client just because they won't pay unless there's a local law in that jurisdiction that permits that type of behavior. Um, and that brings me to a really good tip. So if you're... If your question tells you that local law, there's a local law in that jurisdiction that allows something that goes against the model rules, you always follow what local law says. Because remember the model rules are a model and all states have their own rules. Mm -hmm. So answer which says, 
yes, because it's permitted under local law, that's going to be the correct answer because that's the examiners wanting you to acknowledge that there are model rules, but then states make their own rules. Very important, very important. I think Brittany and I are both in states that have some pretty heavy ethical rules. Yeah, so I just wanted to expose you to a couple of questions to kind of now in these areas that we've been talking about to show you how to go through this question process, right? And then we're gonna go into some conflict of interest fun um, and, and show you something similar. But let's look at this question. So if we're following the method that we've been talking about, we're reading the call of the question first, is it proper for the attorney to accept this limited representation? So we already can see that we know what the, because of the call of the question, we know it's specific. And we know we can read this in terms of a limited representation question. So we have an attorney is widely regarded as an exceptionally competent practitioner in the field of criminal law. A client of the attorney became the subject of a grand jury investigation in a matter that could result in a felony indictment. The client lacked sufficient funds to pay for the attorney's services beyond the grand jury stage. He asked the attorney to provide limited representation for a flat fee. Under the arrangement he proposed, the attorney would advise the client concerning the grand jury investigation, but the representation would end when an indictment was returned or the grand jury decided not to indict. The attorney fully advised the client of the practical and legal aspects of the client's proposal. Is it proper for the attorney to accept this limited representation? So if we do this right, the specific call of the question told us what the legal issue was or what the ethical issue was its scope of representation and whether an attorney can take a limited representation. And we know now from the law, that's the next step, pulling out the general rule, that an attorney can limitedly represent a client as long as that representation is reasonable, right? So the question then becomes here, is it reasonable? And so we have A, yes, because the client and not the attorney suggested the arrangement. B, yes, because the attorney and the client may, ag may agree to limit the scope of representation so long as that limitation is reasonable under the circumstances. C, no, because the attorney should not limit the scope of representation based on the client's ability to pay. Or D, no, because the scope of representation may not be limited in the criminal case. So you might then question yourself, is there an exception? Is there an exception in a criminal case? No, right? So the answer is B and it hits the rule and these other answer choices are trying to distract you from that rule. A is wrong because that's a misstatement of an ethical rule. There's nothing that says that an attorney has to suggest the limited arrangement, right? So that's wrong. Um, C is wrong because it's actually one of the main reasons why we do limit the scope of representation because clients can't afford to pay uh, large sums of money. So in order to facilitate and encourage attorneys representing and helping those pro se litigants, we can limit representation for what their ability to pay actually is. And then the scope of representation does not need to be limit, uh, limited uh, in a criminal case and or it can be. So that was an incorrect yeah. exception that the examiners are trying to make you question yourself for. But if you were studying, what's the rule, right? And are there any exceptions? No. They're the only exception would be if it doesn't meet the rule and it's not reasonable. Yeah, and, and I do see a lot of students fall for D. You know, their assumption is that, oh my God, it's a criminal case, so it can't be limited. But I just want you to remember, and this is worth, you know, knowledge that we have procedural safeguards in place for criminal defendants. They will never not go represent it, right? So this is a little bit of a trick answer that students are like, oh my gosh, we can't deny them the right to counsel. But that is not what this is. This is not a Gideon versus Wainwright situation. There are always procedural safeguards in place for criminal defendants. It just doesn't require you to have to um, uh, represent them unless, of course, you're a court-appointed attorney. Right, exactly. So this was a really good question to take us through some of the process. And here is another one. So if we look at the call of the question, it is not proper for the attorney to, that doesn't tell us anything really about the, uh, what the legal issue is. So now that it's a general call, I know that I have to pull out the legal issue from the fact pattern itself. So 
I have an attorney was retained to appeal the client's criminal conviction and to seek bail pending appeal. The agreed fee for the appearance on the bail hearing was $50 an hour. The attorney received $800 from the client, of which $300 was a deposit to secure the attorney's fee, and $500 was for bail costs in the event that bail was obtained. The attorney maintained two office bank accounts, a fee account in which all fees were deposited and from which all office expenses were paid and a client's fund account. The attorney deposited the 800 in the client's fund account the week before the bail hearing. The attorney expended six hours of time on the bail hearing. <coughs> the effort to obtain bail was unsuccessful. Dissatisfied, the client immediately demanded the return of the $800. So, I know that this is testing a fee dispute. So that's the specific legal issue. And now I have four answer choices where it's gonna be proper for the attorney to do three things and not proper for the attorney to do one thing. So I'm looking to see which is going to be proper and which is not. So we have A, transfer the 800 into the fee account. B, Transfer the $300 into the fee account and leave 500 in the client's fund account until the attorney's uh, fee for the final appeal is determined. Transfer 300 to the fee account and send the client a $500 check on the client's fund account. Or D, send the client a $500 check and leave the $300 in the client's fund account until the matter is resolved. So three of those are actually proper. B, C, and D are proper because they say, okay, there's, it's acknowledging that there's a dispute here. A is absolutely disregarding that there's a dispute. That's, we have a dispute. So taking all of the money and then putting it in your account, that's completely improper, right? Whereas B, C, and D are making it so that way the lawyer is doing something with the disputed amount. In B, or rather, um, in C, the lawyer is just saying, fine, just take the 500, and that's proper if the lawyer doesn't want to dispute the fee, right? And then in B, um, that's the lawyer disputing $500 of the fee. Um, and then again, in D, it's acknowledging that the client can take 500, but I feel like I earned 300, and that's what the disputed am amount is to me. So the only answer choice that doesn't acknowledge the disputed amount and violates the rules is choice A. So different type of NPRE question, but it still had us taking the same steps. What is the specific legal issue in the question? What's the rule that we apply to that? And then what's the answer choice that most closely follows the application of that rule? So we have one more in this category. So is the attorney subject to discipline if he continues to represent the client? So we don't really know what this is about per se in terms of the specific ethical issue, but we can kind of have an idea, right? So an attorney is employed by a client who is a fugitive from justice under indictment for armed robbery. The attorney, after thorough legal research and investigation of the facts furnished by the client, reasonably believes the indictment is fatally defective and should be dismissed as a matter of law. The attorney advised the client of his opinion and urged the client to surrender. The client told the attorney that she would not surrender. The attorney for informed the district attorney that he represented the client and that he had counseled her to surrender, but that she refused to follow his advice. The attorney has not advised his client on how to avoid arrest and prosecution and does not know where she is hiding. Is the attorney subject to discipline if he continues to represent the client? And so, this question has to do with the attorney continuing representation of a client if the attorney, him or herself, is going to engage in unlawful conduct. So, and then there's a difference between the, uh, the client engaging in past conduct. So this is mm -hmm. a really good question in terms of the difference between the two. So yes, because the client is engaging in continuing illegal conduct, B, yes, because the client refused to accept the attorney's advice and surrender. C, no, because the attorney is not counseling the client to avoid arrest and prosecution. D, no, because the attorney reasonably believes the indictment is defective. So the answer in this question is actually C, no, because the attorney is not counseling the client to avoid arrest and prosecution. The attorney has done nothing wrong, right? The attorney actually did what they were supposed to do. 
advise the client not to engage in this illegal conduct. But the attorney, him or herself, is not engaging in illegal conduct. They're actually being honest with the court. So this is a great question of that fine line between uh, permissive and mandatory uh, withdrawal and all of that good stuff. This could perhaps be a permissive withdrawal situation. Absolutely. Permissive withdrawal, perhaps because of reason B, client's not listening to me. Or reason A, client's still doing what I told them to do and it's illegal. Um, D doesn't really have anything to do with the issue at hand. Um, D is kind of like that good faith frivolous type of argument and that's not the specific ethical issue in this question. So know that this question is also interesting because A, B, and C all have to do with continuing to represent a client who's engaged in criminal activity, but D does not, right? So ultimately then you can eliminate D, eliminate the one that's not like the others. Because the examiners want to know whether you can get the correct answer in the midst of similarly situated answers, not whether you can see a, an obvious answer where one is not like the other. So that's just something to always keep in mind too. So now we're moving into the section of the webinar where we're going to just talk about conflicts. And since it's the most heavily tested area, talk about how to approach conflict questions. And then I think we'll take some questions um, from the audience. And so at the outset, know what the different types of conflicts are. We have current client conflicts, third party conflicts, former client conflicts, prospective client conf conflicts, organization as client, which can pose a conflict, um, current and former government officers and employees, and then former judges or arbitrator conflicts. So how do you best study for conflicts? Make a chart, right? Make a chart with each of the different conflicts and in the corresponding box next to the name, put the rule for that conflict. It's really easy to mix up your conflict of interest rules clearly delineate them for yourselves so that way you can visualize it, right? And that's exactly how we're going to review this topic today. We're going to review it as you should study it. Keep the rules for each conflict separate from each other so that way you don't muddle the waters and confuse them. So first one, current client conflict, right? And that's, or you might know that as concurrent conflict. So when you're representing two people at once and they could come at odds with one another. So you can't represent a client simultaneously with another if that representation will be directly adverse to the other client or there's a significant risk that the representation of one client is going to be materially limited by the lawyer's own interests or by the lawyer's responsibilities to another former client. So that's the first thing to do when studying for conflicts. Pull out the conflict of interest rule. What's the second thing to do? Always ask, can the conflict be waived, right? And so you can waive the client conflict here, right? A lawyer can represent even in the midst of a conflict if the lawyer reasonably believes that they can competently represent both parties, the representation's not prohibited by law, the representation doesn't involve the assertion of a claim uh, by plaintiff against the defendant, and each affected person gives informed consent confirmed in writing. So this rule also teaches you what cannot be waived, right? You cannot waive so if, if you represent a plaintiff in a car accident case, you then can't represent the defendant. There's an assertion of one party right against the other. That can't be waived. Uh, but any other representation, at lo as long as these four prongs are met, can be waived. So pull out step one in a conflict of interest question, what's the conflict? So in this, it would be concurrent. What's the rule for that? And then can that conflict be waived? Another hidden issue in these MPRE questions is, is consent actually informed? So conflicts of interest, you have to give informed consent confirmed in writing. But you also might be tested on whether consent was actually informed. So the lawyer has to tell their client, 
what the conflict is, not just that, hey, there might be a conflict, but you have to say what the conflict is and, and how it could impact them, right? So if you get a question that says, the lawyer only told the clients that there could be a conflict of interest, but didn't say anything else, the lawyer can be subject to discipline because you have to say how the conflict can impact the client. Another really important thing to remember is that you can give implied consent confirmed in writing, but you can also revoke it and say, you know what, this is getting weird. I think that this conflict is uh, present and I need to revoke my consent. So, and then here's just some test taking tips on what type of current conflicts to watch out for. Um, representing co-defendants in criminal litigation. That's typically when this type of conflict arises, this type of fact pattern. Call parties in civil litigation. Be careful for those fact patterns. Uh, representing two, conf two clients with inconsistent legal positions in two unrelated cases. Once you see that fact pattern, that triggers concurrent client conflict. Um, Unnamed, unnamed members of a class that don't count as clients. Um, confident, also be careful for confidentiality and privilege problems with all current conflicts. Um, and then there could be conflicts caused by the lawyer's own interests, right? So just pay attention to these fact patterns um, and pay attention to these issues that might arise within these fact patterns. And I just wanted to mention one, um, I think that uh, you may have uh, not mentioned this one that's on your chart, which is representing multiple clients in non-litigation matters. Um, sometimes students are like, you know, what does that look like? And a lot of times this will come up in uh, situations where it's a, a contract issue or a, a, a corporate issue or a business matter. And you have to be careful about representing multiple clients who are negotiating in that contract right? Or just because they're not in litigation, they can absolutely have adverse interests to one another. Right, exactly. So big thing that usually comes up is uh, business transactions with a client. And so you have to have to have to memorize these four elements because you need to make sure each of these elements are prevalent in the fact pattern to see whether the business transaction um, is proper. So a lawyer generally, right, cannot enter into a business transaction with a client um, unless these four things are prevalent. So the terms of the business transaction are fair. So that's the fairness element. The terms are fully disclosed to the client in writing and they're easy for the um, client to understand. That's the disclosure, what I call the disclosure element. Then the client is advised in writing that they should get the advice of independent counsel before. That's the lawyer advice element. And then the client gives informed consent in writing, the writing requirement. So as long as those four are prevalent, it's okay. And the, like I said, and I keep saying this, but the NCBE will be very intentional. And if they want you to think something's not fair, there will be a descriptive fact in that fact pattern that makes it not fair. Um, so you really, again, just want to pay attention to the details, right? The details about people, places, or things. When the examiners are describing something, they're doing so for a reason. Gifts, another issue that arises conflicts. So you can't solicit substantial gifts from clients uh, if they're not a relative, uh, but you can accept a small gift from a client. So like, if a client came by my office and baked me banana bread, I can't, I don't have to say like, sorry, I can't take that. Um, uh, I can take it. Again, the NCBE will be intentional. They won't like say, oh, like they gave the, the, the client gave the attorney a $100 vase. Sorry, that's like kind of up in the air, right? They'll either get a car or a substantial amount of money or they'll get like a bouquet of flowers, right? So it'll be very intentional in the fact pattern. I just, uh, I had a situation where a client was um, giving me a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue, which uh, as many of you know, is one of the, the, the very nice. And I literally was sitting there and I had to be like, I'm sorry to ask you about how much it this cost? <laughs> because as Brittany said, I was like, it's not a bouquet of flowers and it's not a car, but this is actually considered an expensive gift. 
I ended right, up yeah. just so for all of you know, I actually ended up not accepting it. Um, and um, just so you know. So I had a similar situation. I took it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a little like Kate Spade thing. Oh, great. And it's because the woman happened to work at Kate Spade. So she didn't. That's different. Yeah. It. Um, and, I, but I, even though, like, I was like, is this substantial? I was like, mm, it's so cute. I'm going to take it. Um, but if she had got me like a $500 purse, I would not have taken it. Right. 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 So, uh, difference. And then a lawyer also can't prepare a legal instrument where they give themselves a substantial gift unless this is a relative, right? So that's why the devil is in the details. When the examiners tell you the relationship between people, it's important and it's critical. It typically hinges on what the answer is going to be. Literary and media rights. If you've got a really big case, can the lawyer then like write a book about it or get some money on it? Um, not during the representation, but they can be acquired after it as long as the business transaction with the client elements are met, but it can't be anything before. It has to be until the matter is completely um, finished, including all appeals. And, and this is, and one of the biggest reasons is you don't want the lawyer to make this a theatrical representation just for the purposes of having this juicy book afterwards. And I think that that's exactly. really important. And so this piece is hard. So like the NCBE with some instances, they like try to play on your emotions. So like a lot of times there'll be a fact pattern about a client who's struggling financially and they can't afford food and the lawyer says take $200 to buy your groceries. You don't feel like the lawyer should be subject to discipline for that, but they will be because you cannot provide financial assistance to your client when you're representing them. You can advance litigation expenses, court costs, filing fees, but nothing personal, right? If your client's like, I'm so, I don't have any money, but I really want to, I really want that jacket, right? Your lawyer can't be like, here's the money for that jacket. Um, so this is an area where the, where the NCBE can really play on your emotions a little bit. Big ticket item, waiving malpractice liability. So lawyers generally, right, cannot enter into an agreement to waive prospectively malpractice unless that client is independently represented. But note, this is very different from entering into a business transaction with a client where the client had to be advised to obtain counsel but didn't have to obtain it. Here, if you're going to prospectively waive malpractice liability, the, the client actually has to be independently represented by counsel, not just advised. Big difference. A lawyer can, though, represent in a limited liability entity. That doesn't count as waiving malpractice liability. They can limit the scope of representation like we talked about, and they can arbitrate legal malpractice claims. So that's another big difference, right? If there's a, a clause in my fee agreement that says we will arbitrate anything, the client doesn't actually have to be represented by counsel in order to enter into that agreement. They only have to be represented by counsel if they are prospectively waiving malpractice liability. Correct. So then next piece is third party conflicts. And what comes up the most with this type of conflict, it's getting paid by a third party. So like this happened to me a lot in the- Yes. Beginning of my represent, in the beginning of my law practice, I'd always represent people with DUIs. And unfortunately, a lot of young kids were getting some DUIs. So like mom would pay, right? So like mom would be like, I'm hiring you for my son, blah, blah, blah. And once you do that, the mom wants to know everything, wants to control the case, yep. wants to just like run the show. But that's third party conflict. So you, the person who's paying cannot interfere with the representation at all, and they can't get confidential client information, right? So it's like you're paying because the person agreed for you to pay, and that's it, right? You have no say or stake in this litigation or in this case. So there's also a third-party conflict if there is a third person that's creating a substantial risk of materially limiting a lawyer's ability to represent someone effectively. Um, Maybe that's a third, like um, maybe that's an organization that the lawyer belongs to, and that organization wants to cut down all the trees, 
and you represent the person who wants to save the trees, right? That could potentially be a third party conflict. So that's mostly how those come up. Then we have former client conflicts. What's the most important thing to know with these? There's a continuing duty of confidentiality. Just because I don't represent you anymore doesn't mean I can go out there and, and air all of your secrets and everything that we've talked about, right? And so if I have confidential information about a former client, I cannot use it then to represent someone new or I can't use it to my advantage or a current client's advantage. So absent any informed consent confirmed in writing from my former client, I cannot represent a client whose interests are materially adverse to my former client, right? So I need that informed consent confirmed in writing. So one big item that's always tested and that confuses people a lot is um, what's going on with the firm though. Can the firm still represent the person? Is the conflict imputed to the firm? It's confusing. So if you ever have a question dealing with a lawyer who's kicked out from representation, but it's asking whether the firm can represent that person still, you're dealing with a conflict and the potential of a firm. So you're looking at the issue of screening and whether screening then can save the firm from hearing the case. And so if a lawyer is disqualified from representing a client and the lawyer is joining a new firm, the new firm also might be disqualified from that client unless they're screening. So unless the lawyer is properly screened and doesn't share any portion of the fees and that former client is given notice of the representation. What happens with the former firm then? The lawyer's former firm is going to be prohibited from representing a person with interests that are materially adverse of a client if the matter is the same or substantially related to that in which the formerly associated lawyer represented the client and the lawyer remaining in the firm has information protected by confidentiality. So note the differences, right? So it falls into the fact of, are we dealing with a new firm or are we applying the laws of a former firm, right? So the more you break down these questions and the more you see that specific rules fall within certain situations, the higher you will get an MPRE score, right? So you won't mix up the new firm with the former firm rules. So you wanna have everything separated and separated for yourselves. You also might have an issue of current and former government officers and employees. Biggest issue, it's this, this is the big ticket phrase, participated personally and substantially, right? So a lawyer who leaves government employment and enters in private practice, they then can't represent a person in which they participated personally and substantially while in government service unless the government gives that informed consent confirmed writing. So we're seeing another pattern. The former entity or the government always needs to give informed consent and they need to be given notice. And so what does a matter? So when I say that they, rep they participated in a matter uh, personally and substantially, what's matter? It, it involves specific facts, right? It's a case in controversy and there's a dispute. What does personally and substantially mean? It means you worked on the case. You didn't just like make copies of something one day. You actually and personally worked on the case in some capacity. Remember that that imputed qualification or disqualification issue that we just talked about, it also implies, applies to former government officers. So you, your firm, right, if you go to a law firm and you are personally disqualified because you are a former government worker, you'll have to be screened, right? So the former government lawyer is going to be screened, they're not going to be given any portion of the case, and notice is given to the government. Same rule with former judges and arbitrators. Same exact rule, personally and substantially. So just like we talked about with government workers, 
someone who was a former judge or a former, former arbitrator and is now going into private practice, they cannot represent a person in a private matter in which they previously participated personally and substantially as that former capacity as judge or arbitrator. And again, screening with the firm would need to happen. So then, and I think lastly, we have prospective client conflicts. So Tanya and I already talked about this a little bit when we were talking about like taking a call um, and not being able to then divulge their information. It's the same thing. So representation never attached, but I consulted with this person to think about representation or to give them maybe some advice about something. So client confidentiality attaches to this prospective client. And so I cannot then tell someone what that prospective client told me um, in order to benefit somebody else. Brittany, you're on mute. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> so that wasn't the last one. Now we have organization as this is my favorite. This is my favorite part because this is what I do for a living. And this is a conflict that comes up all the time. I'll, I'll let Brittany talk about this and then if I have some juicy stories to tell you, I'll interject them. <laughs> so the biggest thing to remember about this and the biggest tip is to know that your client's the organization, not the constituents within the organization. So your duty is to the organization itself, not to any employees or directors or officers of that organization. And so that's really, really important. And so there might come a time where you get a question dealing with protecting the organization. And because you have to protect the organization from itself. So if the lawyer representing the organization and goes to people within the organization and nothing's being done, the lawyer can do whatever they need to to protect the organization, even if that includes like going to the press and telling them about what's about to happen so that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But if the lawyer is simply hired just not to represent the organization, but just to investigate a violation of law or a potential violation of law, the lawyer can't do that. The lawyer can't protect the organization from itself and disclose a bunch of information because the organization's not the lawyer's client, right? And so this is just really important. The biggest takeaway to remember is that the organization is your client, not the people within it. So you also have a duty to go up to Sally. Sally comes up to you and says, I think, I think this organization is discriminating against me. You're my lawyer, right? No, you have a duty to say, sorry, Sally, I represent the company. I don't re represent you, the people within the, co the company. And you could be subject to discipline for not making that clear to workers in an organization. Um, I also want to sort of bring up, because I've seen interestingly more questions of late having to do with what about when you have these closely held companies where there's like two people or three people, or in many cases, one person, right? The duty is no different, okay? I have many one person company clients. And if I feel as though the client is doing something that adversely actually affects their entity, even though essentially, they're the only person in the entity that, and, and I've seen some tricky questions about this, that does not in any way make your duty any less, oh, okay, there's just a few people, right? Or there's really just this one person. You have to, regardless, always at every time, you make sure that you are representing that company. And if your client, even if they're the only or owner of that company, decides to do something abhorrent, to the company itself and makes the company in anything violate the law or do anything wrong, again, your duty is always to the organization. And, and I have too many stories to tell about this, but you can imagine the shock a lot of times um, it, when clients hear this. And that's why it is so extraordinarily important to put in that letter um, or I represent the organization, uh, don't represent you. Uh, same thing with any situation. I represent this client, I don't represent you, the third party payer, or anything like that. Exactly. And so then we 
kind of went through all of the big conflict items that are going to come up. And then I've already alluded to all of this, but then how do we approach conflict of interest questions? First thing, we have to identify the con that, it, that is a conflict question, right? So that's the first step. Then identify which type of conflict of interest is being tested in the question. Then identify what the rule is for that and then ask whether that conflict is consentable. And then if applicable, if it's asking you about the law firm, ask whether screening is appropriate. And then ask yourself with all of these above considerations, is representation ethical? So let's just test it out in a couple of questions so we can go through that conflict of interest formula. Unfortunately, the MPRE is no longer on paper with pencil like this picture shows, but I didn't have a picture of a cool like online testing one. <laughs> okay, so with this call of the question, we have um, if the son requests that the attorney represent him in opposing probate of the second will on the grounds of fraud and undue influence, is it proper for the attorney to do so? So we kind of can see that this probably will be a conflict question just from the call alone. So we have an attorney prepared a will for a client and acted as one of the subscribing witnesses to the client's execution of the will. The will left all of the client's estate to his son. Later, the at the client's request, and the attorney prepared a second will for the client and acted as one of the subscribing witnesses to the client's execution of the second will. The second will left one half of the client's estate to his son and the other one half to his housekeeper. The client died and the housekeeper has offered the second will for probate. If the son requests that the attorney represent him in opposing the probate of the second will on the grounds of fraud and undue influence, is it proper for the attorney to do so? So we know this is a conflicts question. And so that second step was identify which type of conflict it is. So if I look to see what type it is, former, perspective, current, right? We have that it's probably going to be a, a perspective one because now representing the son simultaneously is going to completely impact the attorney's will. That's being probated. The attorney made that will, right? And so that's creating this type of current conflict. So we have A, yes, because after the client's death, the attorney may represent his son. B, yes, because the client's son is a beneficiary under both wills. C, no, because an attorney guarantees the validity of a will that he or she prepares. Uh, not a correct statement of law. No. <laughs> no, because the attorney would be taking a position adverse to a will she prepared and witnessed. So the answer is D, right? Because it completely applies the current conflict rules. You cannot take a case that's completely adverse to what you are doing, right? To, adverse to your client. The position is completely adverse to a will that the lawyer made, right? And so they would be arguing against their own will. Like, oh yeah, my will that I made is invalid. You can't do that, right? And if we go to that step next, is this conflict consentable? No, because one of those unconsentable conflicts is you cannot consent to a conflict that is completely adverse to your position or two positions adverse to each other, right? And so the answer is D. Yeah, so an attorney does not guarantee the validity of a will that he or she prepares. So that's not a correct statement of the rule. And remember too, that representation and confidentiality and all that stuff continues after death, right? So um, you still, the attorney still made the will whether the person is alive or dead right now, it's, it's not really relevant, right? The conflict exists because the attorney made up an existing will. So let's look at one more. Call of the question tells us that it's a conflict question pretty much. Is it proper for the attorney to represent the wife in this matter? Anytime you get a question where it's asking if it's, a, if it's proper for the attorney to represent someone, it's likely conflicts, right? So. We have an attorney represented a husband and wife in the purchase of a business financed by contributions from their respective separate funds. The business was jointly operated by the husband and the wife after acquisition. After several years, a dispute arose over the management of the business. 
The husband and wife sought the attorney's advice and the matter was settled on the basis of an agreement drawn by the attorney and signed by the husband and the wife. Later, the wife asked the attorney to represent her in litigation against her husband based on the claim that her husband was guilty of fraud and misrepresentation in negotiations for the prior settlement agreement. The husband has not retained counsel in this matter. So is it proper for the attorney to represent the wife in this matter? So we can just blatantly see the conflict of interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we can see it, husband and wife. The attorney represented both of them before, and now the wife wants to sue the husband in, in, in something that the attorney represented them both. So we have A, yes, because all information relevant to the litigation was received by the attorney in the presence of both the husband and the wife. B, yes, because there is reason to believe the husband misled both the wife and the attorney at the time of their prior agreement. C, no, because the attorney had previously acted for both parties in reaching the agreement now in dispute. And D, no, because the husband is not now represented by independent counsel. So this is a current conflict, right? It would be representing, um, and it's actually kind of a former client conflict because the husband is also a former client. Um, but it also has to deal with the fact of it would be a current conflict because what creates a current conflict is you have this suit currently and I represented husband in the past and you're trying to sue them based on an agreement I've represented both of you on, right? So the answer is C. No, because the attorney had previously acted for both parties in reaching an agreement now in dispute. So the attorney represented both people and now when they want to sue each other based on the agreement, the attorney cannot do so, right? Because that's a, that's a direct conflict that will not be consentable. So answer is C, no, because the attorney had previously acted for the parties in reaching the agreement now in dispute. So we went through a lot of information, um, a lot, but are there any questions? I've had a couple of questions come in uh, for it, and one of them, and I'll be happy to answer this one, um, is was about the compensation from third parties. And um, one of the questions was, if the client allows you, you know, to talk to that third party, um, then then do you need to do whatever that third party says? If that if the client says, and this happens all the time, you know, oh, well, my husband is helping me pay for my business or my wife is helping me pay, just listen to whatever they say. And I would say that only one of the prongs is that the client gives informed consent, right? You still have a duty as an attorney to make sure that that third party does not interfere with your judgment, even if your client's like, you can listen to whatever that third party says right? So you have a duty to make sure they don't, and that it doesn't compromise the client's confidential information. So in many situations where a client says, okay, well, you know, my mom's paying, my husband's paying, my wife's paying, just listen to whatever they say, that, in, that informed consent still does not limit your other two duties, which is to make sure it doesn't interfere with your client uh, judgment and does not compromise client information. In another situation um, that I'm in is that my cousin has, has retained an attorney, but because I'm also an attorney, she wants me involved. So what ended up happening is her attorney started only replying to me. And I said, you need to reply to your client, uh, my cousin, in all of these communications. And that attorney said, well, it's confusing to reply to both of you, so I'm just going to reply to you only replying to me in that email. And so again, and I had to, you know, I hate doing this, but I had to school her a little bit and say, you know what, you can't do that. As confusing as it is, baby, to reply to two email addresses, my cousin is your client. So if I say anything or do anything, just because I'm an attorney does not mean I'm doing everything right. So if I do anything or say anything that in any way adversely affects her or compromises her confidential information or leaves her out of this, you cannot just talk to me, even if, even if she goes, go ahead and talk to my cousin, because that will compromise the attorney-client relationship, regardless of what your client says in that situation. Um, 
another question. This is a good one, um, Britt. Not that the other one wasn't a good one. Um, <laughs> was what about when questions talk about subject to discipline versus subject to liability versus subject to sanctions? How are we supposed to know the differences between those? Yeah, so if it asks you if they're sub subject to discipline, that's a violation of the model rule. If it asks you if they are going to be subject to liability, that's the civil malpractice rule. And so you have to apply the malpractice standards versus the ethical rule. And so you might not be subject to malpractice, but you might violate an ethical rule. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive. So in your MPRE outlines, there will be some rules regarding civil malpractice liability, and essentially it's negligence, that you had a duty and you breached that duty to your client. Um, and, and there that, were damages. Yeah, and that breach resulted in damages. And so that's applying a malpractice standard when it asks for liability. Sanctions um, typically the court similar yeah and it's it's by the court and it's probably going to be talking about rule 11 which isn't too, too much on the MPRE but it has come up uh, and so that's then something applied by the courthouse or the courthouse the judge uh, in the court and then civil liability is liability from a court to the attorney and then the ethical rules, that's a violation of an ethical rule, and that's the board of bar examiners. And the person who gave you your license, that's a disciplinary hearing against them by you, or and, against you by them. And this kind of really goes back to what we were saying before about just because you have committed an ethical violation, um, or actually, let me say it in the reverse, just because there's no damage to a client doesn't mean you haven't committed an ethical violation. And so I think one of the biggest differences to also look at is that um, you could be subject to malpractice, right? Um, and usually that means that not only have you probably broken an ethical rule, though not always, um, but usually it does, is that you've harmed your client. But don't think, again, just because you haven't harmed your client, that that means you're not going to get in trouble because that's why we have the ethical rules, right? That's sort of like, that's the lower bar. It's sort of like, you might not get in trouble, or sorry, your client might not be harmed, but you've broken this ethical rule. Civil liability, there's this element of malpractice, and as Brittany said, it goes back to negligence, duty, breach, um, causation, damages, and there are damages. And then finally, sanctions, which are not tested as much, but have come up, is when the court is like, hey, lawyer, you're misbehaving. You know, and that could be an implication of all of them possibly. It could be an ethical violation, it could be subject to sanctions, it could be malpractice, but that's when the court is getting upset. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so make sure that when you are looking at that call to question, you also pay attention to whether or not it's subject to liability, subject to discipline, um, and those sorts of things. So you know where you are, so you're not automatically like, well, this is wrong, so they're definitely subject to malpractice. Well, it might be wrong under the model rules, but it may not subject um, the attorney to malpractice. Um, another question that came in, and let me just find that the, the situation. Um, oh, yes. So in the question about um, an attorney is employed by a client fugitive, we have a question that says, you know, I, I since we had just talked about, um, you know, permissive withdrawal, I thought that this question was going to be about withdrawal. Um, so it threw me off that it was about subject to discipline. What do I do in that situation? So it technically was about withdrawal um, in the sense of, if it was a mandatory withdrawal and the attorney didn't do it, they would have been subject to discipline. So it's, it's right. related. So yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh no, sorry, Brittany. Um, I was just going to say th this, what you, what you have to um, sometimes know is that this, the question is not going to say, and you're lucky if it is, um, does, does, can the attorney permissively withdraw? or does the attorney have to withdraw all the time, right? What will happen is you'll have to take the rules and extrapolate, right? 
So you know that they can withdraw in certain situations and you know that they must withdraw in certain situations. So what you are asking, what they're, you know, are they subject to discipline? All they're saying is, you know what, does he have to withdraw? That, so just, you just want to paraphrase it in your mind. Oh, does, if he considers, does he have to withdraw? And that's going to help you um, get to the right answer on this also because you are taking the withdrawal rules and you're just paraphrasing for that. Sorry, Brittany, did you have anything else to say on that? No. There was another question that just came in. Mm -hmm. How long is too long to stay working on a question if you're stuck before moving on and return to that problem later? I'd say that if you're approaching the three minute mark, it's time to move on. Yeah. I'd say three minutes. Yeah, and I think, do they still also technically have 1.8 minutes per question for the MPRE or is it a little bit? No, different? so MPRE, yeah, MPRE is two minutes yeah. um, per question. So right when you're approaching three minutes, I would star it, flag it, move on, go to the next one. So that way, because remember the, it's, you want to maximize your amount of points, right? Yeah. So um, you want to save time and have time for questions that you might get right later to, to tally up those points and spending too much time on one question that you might get wrong and then therefore not finishing or jeopardizing your ability to answer other questions. You don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, I might have a, a slightly, you know, the same take, maybe a little bit different is that what I get nervous about is that you're leaving points on the table it, right. and because all questions are weighed equally is that taking too long on one question is gonna jeopardize, say, four other questions that you could have gotten right. So what I like to, to often say is, you know, you wanna practice getting, you know, X number of questions done in X number of minutes. So you wanna get 10 questions done in 20 minutes. So I agree with Brittany that you don't have to always, you know, say, okay, two minutes are done, I'm gone. But if you're at the 20 minute mark, right? And you have not done 10 questions, that is how I would look at it. So if you spent three minutes on one question, let's hope that we'll only take you one minute to do another question. So I would probably divide it into question, you know, all right, at, at 20 minutes, have I done 10 questions? At 40 minutes, have I done 20 questions? That sort of situation. Because remember, you don't want to leave points on the table. It's not like the SAT where some questions are weighted more than others. Right. Exactly. Or sorry, that's not true. The SAT where if you guess wrong, you're penalized versus, right. as you can tell, it's been a long time since I've taken the SAT. <laughs> um, any other questions? Cool. Well, we do have a couple of webinars coming up and I don't, and I, I know that everyone either watching or um, going to watch this recording is maybe in different areas, but even if you're not a 1L, I mean, even if you're a 2L or 3L, it might be just really helpful uh, to come. So on October 17th, how to outline effectively, and then on November 7th, how to write a law school exam. Yeah, um, feel free to check those out. They're always free. We're also going to post this um, on YouTube and our various other channels, but you'll also get um, an email with the recording of the webinar since you actually signed up for the webinar. And for those of you who are interested and you're taking the exam at the end of October, we do have a workshop um, on October 10th. Um, and even though that is a paid workshop, what we do is we're going to go through, we have 60, a 60 question exam that we have you take beforehand. And then what Brittany and I are going to do is take you through methodically those questions and answers and sort of group them in the areas that they belong, conflict of interest, you know, things like that, and take you through those um, as a sort of intentional practice, as Brittany had referred to before. So one of the things that sometimes students are like, I know you told me to practice intentionally, I don't know what that means. Um, or we've had students say, uh, I can take a 60 exam question on my own, why would I come to this? And so it's sort of a combination of both. Um, it is a way to say, all right, what does it look like to intentionally practice? Let's see how we go through these questions so that you can emulate that or simulate that for your own practice. And for those who says, you know, I can do a question exam on my own, you are doing the question uh, exam on your own. What we're trying to do with you over the time that we spend with you is to 
um, actually take some of the work, put it on us to teach to you on how would we go through each of those questions as opposed to just reading the answer, which you know you would have and say, okay, I got it wrong, I got it right. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone who's come today. It's a Saturday. It's a I know. Like where anyone is, but it's a beautiful Saturday here on the East Coast. It's, it's 103 degrees here on the West Coast. Oh, is it? Oh, you know, was... that's one thing I miss. Uh, I'll tell everyone I just recently came from the East Coast. And yesterday I was moving and it was 106 degrees. And I can tell you one of the things I might not miss the snow, but I certainly miss the beautiful falls. You know, I miss oh, it's, like high, it's like high 60s. That's and I think gorgeous. We reached 70 today. Just 70 I think that's flat. wonderful. It shouldn't be yeah. 103 degrees in <laughs> October. I can't even, like, honestly, I'm like, it's October because to me, it still feels like summer. And I was telling this to my parents yesterday. I'm like, this is getting old. You know, <laughs> like, hello, fall, you know, things like that. So I actually realized that I miss, I miss, not, not, n no harping on the West Coast, my West Coasters. I'm just saying um, that is one thing that I very much miss. And Brittany, I miss Brittany. She's on the East Coast. So no reason to get sad. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. And you know, this recording will be back or, or available in case you want to watch it again. Bye.